Good morning. So my name is Michelle Spencer, and I am the Associate Director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. Um, the director is Dr. Josh Sharfstein, who's also the Dean of, oh, good morning, Josh, uh, also the Dean of um, Practice. And so we are very excited to have you here with us this morning, and certainly um, the first uh, for us in the initiative office, the first of our five symposias. And so. Um, we really appreciate your being here. We appreciate the energies that you bring. And certainly we are excited about what today will bring for us. A few housekeeping. Um, the back door to your right, um, and then make a, a left, will be the ladies' room. The back door on this side to your right, um, and then make an immediate left, will be the men's room. So if you please exit this way on your right hand side to the ladies room and then make a left and exit through this door and make a left for the men's room. Okay, awesome. Um, breakfast, as you know, is um, to your right as well in that corridor. So please um, feel free to get up at any moment in time and, and have something to eat as well as to drink. Um, we are, again, excited about today. So we have a full day that promises, I, I kid you not, it promises to leave you energized with the possibilities of transforming adolescent health in the US. So that is scary of a statement that I just said, right? I said it, it promises to energize you with the possibilities of transforming adolescent health in the United States. Yeah, thank you for that. I, thank you for that. I, I needed that and appreciate it. And so we have in the room, and very intentionally so in this room, identified researchers, ed educators, um, individuals with lived experiences. All of you are experts in helping us to frame and think through how we can really move the needle in advancing adolescent health here. And so today it's my honor to introduce to you the co-leaders, uh, the faculty co-leaders of our adolescent health area, no other than Tamar uh, Medelson and Kristen Mamari. So Tamar is an associate professor in the Department of Mental Health here at Hopkins. Her research addresses the development, evaluation, and dissemination of prevention strategies to improve maternal and child mental health with a focus on underserved urban populations. Relating to youth and adolescents, Dr. Mendelson is currently evaluating mindfulness-based and cognitive behavioral approaches for improving emotional and behavioral outcomes among urban middle and high school students. She's also working on research related to mental health, assessing mindfulness-based and cognitive behavioral strategies to improve maternal mental health and prevent postpartum depression in the context that serves at-risk women, including home visitation programs and neonatal intensive care, in neonatal intensive care units. Dr. Mari is an associate professor in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health here at Hopkins School of Public Health. Her work is primarily focused in the area of youth-friendly health services and risk and protective factors relating to reproductive health outcomes around adolescents. She specializes in conducting qualitative research and evaluating health service programs aimed at improving the health and well-being of adolescents. Internationally, Dr. Mari has provided technical assistance to the World Health Organization, UNAID, and UNICEF to develop HIV strategies, indicators, and survey modules for global adolescent health surveillance projects. She has also co-authored two manuals on monitoring and evaluating adolescent reproductive health projects for developing countries health professionals and developed training materials for the focus on youth adolescent programs. And so please join me in welcoming both Tamar and Kristen. All right. Thank you so much. This is so exciting to see all of you. I can't believe this day has finally arrived. So this is the first symposium out of five that are gonna be um, coming up um, as part of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. So some of you have traveled far away to get here, and so I really appreciate this. This means so much. I'm, I'm really excited to hear what, what is all gonna happen and unfold today. So before we begin, I just wanna acknowledge a few individuals in this room. So first of all, Dr. Joff Sharpstein, um, who is the director of this initiative, and um, he's also, as Michelle said, the dean of practice and training here at the school. So, his leadership with Michelle, it's just been extraordinary to work with them. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge the initiative office. They have worked tirelessly last minute to try to pull all the logistics associated with this. And they're not, they don't really get a break because there's another symposium that's following soon after this. Um, I also want to acknowledge Jessica Layton from Bloomberg Philanthropies for coming here. Um, I also, my, my chair of my department, Dr. Cynthia Minkovitz is here, so thank you so much. It really means a lot. And I want to thank all the faculty um, who have been part of our working group and helping us to plan and think through some of these issues. So thank you very much. Um, finally, as you'll notice, this is focused on um, opportunity youth. And there are many youth here in attendance. And it's been humbling for us, Tamara and I, to work with just an extraordinary group of youth who have really helped and uh, provided us with amazing um, in-depth um, feedback along the way. So I just want to thank you all. It really means a lot. So now I want to just tell you a little bit about the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, because that is really kind of the mechanism that brought us all together. So in 2016, it was um, Michael Bloomberg and Bloomberg Philanthropies announced this transformational $300 million gift to Hopkins to create the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. So through investments in education, in research, and in practice and policy, this initiative is expected to really tackle these core areas that are, we believe, are having a huge impact on the health of Americans. And so those areas are violence, addiction, and um, overdose, environmental challenges, obesity in the food system, and then risk to adolescent health. So the initiative then is really expected to target all these areas through a systemic approach that is really meant to um, target vulnerable populations and measure results associated with that. And then we also, through two different fellowship programs, an MPH fellowship program and a DRPH fellowship program, we're hoping to train a new generation of leaders that can actually work with communities across the nation to develop um, new solutions, new types of research that we could that could provide insight um, in terms of what works, and to hopefully champion new policies and programs for addressing each of these areas. So it's through all of these efforts that we hope that maybe we can make a huge difference in improving the health of Americans. So that now brings us to our group, the risk to adolescent health. So one of the first things that Tamara and I grappled with when we took on this role is where do we even, even begin? And unlike these other um, challenge areas, ours is really focused on a specific population group rather than a specific health area. And so Tamar first and I had to ask ourselves, well, what health outcome, where, where do we begin? So through a series of conversations with our working group members, we ultimately decided to focus on opportunity youth, which surprisingly has been largely ignored by public health. So what do I mean when I say opportunity youth? Well, they're most commonly defined by what they're not doing. And that is that they are 16 to 24 year olds who are not in school and not working. And while we use the term opportunity youth to indicate that we believe that each has potential to thrive, they actually do face a, dispor a disproportional share of health risks, including homelessness, poverty, addiction, um, Early, childbear, early childbearing, to just name a few. And so for our public health standpoint, this population does need incredible attention. But most of you in this room already know that. In fact, some of you have been working with this population for over decades. And so we really feel that this symposium is a starting point for us to really learn from you about how we can best use our tools of public health to go forward in addressing this population. There was a statement by one of you in this room that has really stuck with me. And that is, if we can really successfully invest in this population, we can reduce poverty. Just think about that. In public health, poverty is one of the biggest drivers to decide who's healthy and who's not. And so that is why today is a very meaningful day, because we believe that we can learn from all of you to really help us understand how best to address this population in order to improve the health of Americans. So thank you. And now I'd like to give this over to my wonderful colleague, Tamar, who's been just an absolutely amazing partner in this whole initiative. And I can't imagine working with anyone else. So thank you.
Hello, good morning. So, um, Kristen and I both work in the area of adolescent health and mental health, but we really consider ourselves newcomers to the area of opportunity youth. And we've just been on the most incredible journey for the past few months. We've had the opportunity to meet and talk with so many of you in this room and others who couldn't be here today. And we've just been blown away by the amazing work that is happening in this field. And so it's really thrilling to sort of be here today and actually see so many of you together in this room and have the opportunity to sort of put our heads together. And one of the main goals that we have for today is that collectively we can identify and really think about some of the key issues and the key next steps that we can take to move forward um, to being able to really prevent and reduce youth disconnection. So what we're really hoping for is not that we don't want to talk at you all day. We really want this to be a space for questions, for dialogue, for discussion. And um, you'll see that we have two breakout sessions today. One is in the morning, one is in the afternoon. And these are really key pieces of the day because this is when you'll have a chance to brainstorm and talk and think about what should we do next? And how can the Bloomberg Initiative be helpful in supporting these next steps? So we can't wait to hear what all of you have to say. Now you all have a folder uh, with you, hopefully, that you've been given. And there is a program agenda in there and sort of a guide to the day. There's also a description of the speakers and moderators for today. And there is a draft conceptual model. I'm sure this is what you've all been waiting for to wake you up on a Wednesday morning. Who doesn't love conceptual models, right? So this is, um, I have to say again that it is a draft model, but this is a model that we've been developing that will become a figure in a paper that we're working on um, as a companion to this symposium, um, really thinking about how public health tools and approaches can be used um, in the field of opportunity youth. And we really would love your feedback on this model. So that's part of why we've included it in the folder. And we also want it to sort of help inform our thinking today. This is sort of a sense of how we are conceptualizing the issue. Um, and, and we hope that it can really help to fit in some of the talks, some of the ideas that are um, being discussed today. So you can see that we think about youth as being embedded in these different levels of family, school, community, and society. And at each of these levels are different risk factors and different protective factors that influence how young people develop. And we really see disconnection from school and employment, not just as an outcome, but really as a process that unfolds over time with multiple opportunities for intervention. And both re-engagement of, of opportunity youth once they've already become disconnected from school and work is critical, but also prevention before these things have happened is, is key as well. And so as we move through the day, we'll be talking both about re-engagement and prevention and how can we better integrate these spheres and these, these types of interventions. So it's time for me to stop talking and introduce our first speaker of the day. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Lashawn Amato. And um, Lashawn has an incredible story of moving from disconnection to a position of leadership. He is a leader of young people. He has a master's from Northeastern University. He is currently the National Coordinator of Community Action Teams for Opportunity Youth United. And he has already been a great friend and resource to our working group. He flew in from Boston to speak at a youth event held about a month ago that was planned by our Youth Advisory Council. And we're so glad that he's with us today. So please welcome me and in, 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 please join me in welcoming LaShawn. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm blessed. This is my second time in Baltimore. I was fortunate to meet the young leaders. Last time I was here, I see Sydney and the crew in the corner, uh, my brother right here. Um, so it's an honor. 
Um, so I've been charged um, for about 10, 15 minutes to talk to you guys just about my story as a former Opportunity Youth uh, and my pathway as a leader um, for my community um, and young people across um, the U.S. and hopefully globally soon. Um, so I just want to start off by saying that when I was a young kid, um, I had a vision to be a lawyer. And my uncle used to tell me all the time that, you know, Sean, you like to argue a lot. You know, you'll make a great attorney one day. Um, and I carried that with me. And as a young boy, I worked really hard to try to make that happen. I would watch all the shows and I really create that image for myself. Um, I went to a good school and I got a lot of support from my teachers. I made the honor roll and I really f knew what it felt like to be supported. And that, uh, and, and it was in a, in a city outside of Boston, in East Boston, um, and that lasted to about fifth or sixth grade. And despite my vision, I learned quickly that society had a different vision for me as a brown boy from Boston. And while I spent six hours of my day in privilege in the city of East Boston, I spent most of my time living in poverty. That set me off to a bad start. For starters, I grew up in a single parent home, so I was forced to grow up faster than others. My first memory of my father was in a jail cell, and my last memory of him was in a grave. As a young boy, my house was raided by the FBI, guns drawn, threatening to take me away from my family, and that was my first impression of law enforcement. At one point in my life, as a teenager, I was bouncing from couch to couch to couch, trying to get by. Going through the public school system, I had a classroom of over 40 kids. We were sitting at tables like this, and three of us had to share one book, and we couldn't dare take a book home. And lastly, I was pulled over by the police, embarrassed and violated in my own community, patted down, and the only excuse that they had for me was, you fit a profile. So all, throughout all that, I was, I was expected to push through and just keep it up, man. Pull up your pants and push through. But as the trauma started to pile on, I finally gave in. It became too much. The A's and B's turned into F's. I started hanging out in the hallways, found me a little crew, started having a little fun. And eventually, one thing led into another, and I was kicked out of high school and left on the streets. Now, this, is a, this story is not unique to me. This is a story of millions of young people across the, the nation. No one is born in the hopes of being, uh, I gave a TED talk before, um, some of you may have seen it or not, but you know, I, I, one, one of the sides I made it clear that no, one, no young person ever grows up and says to themselves, yeah, I wanna grow up and be a killer or a robber or a thug or a gangster. Like me, millions of young people grew up with the vision to become doctors and lawyers and so on and so forth. But the conditions of poverty and systems failure, keyword system failure, disrupts that vision for them and robs them of their dreams. At times when young people need the most support, they are given the cold shoulder. Instead of simply asking why I was missing days, why I was sleeping in class, or why I was acting out, instead, the school system suspended me, failed me, pushed me out. The juvenile justice system decided to label me as truant and enter me on this path to the school to prison pipeline. With no education and a record, I couldn't find a job. So all that to say, like, I felt like society had gave up on me, so I rebelled, I gave in. I'm gonna give them what they want. I'm a black man in America. After being in the streets, I found myself in a vicious cycle that I knew I had to break. I was looking for a second chance, but I, had, I, didn't, have any, I didn't know have an idea of where to go. But I quickly found out that dropping out of high school would become a blessing in disguise. I found my second chance at a, at a program called Youth Build. At a time, again, when I felt like every system, when I felt like the entire world was against me, Youth Build and the staff there were there to welcome me with open arms, even though I wasn't really receptive to it at, at the time. They loved me up, they set high expectations for me, and I was off from there. 
I entered the program with the expectation of just getting my GED, maybe getting a trade, but they said, they set a vision for me to try college, and they said, Sean, guess what? Don't say it ain't for you unless you try it, right? They paid for me to go. They gave me a ride to the campus. They did all they had to do. They even sat in on the class with me and a few of my other peers. And guess what? That's all it took. Immediately after that first class, I enrolled full time, pushed through, made all, every honor society you could possibly think of, and I stand before you today with a master's degree in nonprofit management from Northeastern University. Uh, <clears throat> but I got all of that because I got the support, um, and I had adults there to, to see, that, see that vision for me, even when I didn't see it for myself. And while I'm not looking to be a lawyer anymore, they have given me a platform to argue and debate for my community through advocacy and public policy. So that brings me to um, the work that I've done with OIU, that I'm doing with Opportunity Youth United. Despite overcoming life's major obstacles, I knew I had to pay it forward. I no longer had this vision to make it out, make, get rich and get out the hood. I wanted to stay there and bring in more resources, opportunity, and most importantly, and most importantly hope. While I was climbing this ladder of success, I knew I could only make it so far without um, bringing up those that come behind me. So I committed myself to do whatever I had to do to provide those opportunities for the young people um, in my neighborhood and, and beyond. With that said, I work with my peers, some of them in the room, Kimberly Pham, Shawnee Jackson, and many others, to create a platform called, a, a set of policy recommendations called increasing, decreasing, decreasing poverty, increasing opportunity, decreasing poverty in America, sorry. And I wish I had a copy, a copy of it with me. And with those recommendations, we are building a grassroots movement led by opportunity youth and their adult allies with the goal of reconnecting one million young people a year. We have developed a platform with six pathways to, for young people to make it out of poverty, which includes greater access to higher education, more access to programs like Youth Build, access to mentoring and, and caring adults, access to mentors, um, access to private internships, and improved services for reentry pathways. And those are just quick fixes to reconnect one million young people a year, right? We got about five, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but we're still in the millions. But to reconnect one million young people, we've laid out these six pathways. But we understand that that's just putting out small fires, right? We, we, we recognize that there's system change that needs to happen in order to really um, meet the goals that we've set out to, to put out. So we've also developed um, recommendations for system change in criminal justice, education, uh, community development, the family, the list goes on. But this is a document. Right now, we are building power. <laughs> We've morphed into a grassroots movement and we're building power within 10 communities through our community action team, where young people are tracking and analyzing data on the opportunity youth in their city and analyzing city budgets to figure out how much is being spent and what are the gaps and what it's gonna take to fill it and really being the change agents and bringing those resources into their community. They're recruiting their peers and registering them to um, vote in the community and build their political powers to start moving the resources. They're organizing forums, attending town halls, testifying and doing whatever they have to do to build relationship with those in power to have their issues heard and recognized. And most importantly, they're finding their way back onto a path to success by being exposed to programs, jobs, and other social capital. And with that said, I just wanna um, close this out with an appreciation and a call to action. While I'm happy that the conversation about Opportunity Youth is starting to become about health, because we recognize that young people need more than jobs and education. But they also need help, they also need healing, healthy lifestyles, and healthy minds. It's not good enough just to put a young person into a job, or it's not good enough to just meet your outcome. Because if that person enters a job and they're not mentally prepared or have the capacity to deal with the obstacles that are still that they still continue to deal with, they will not be successful in that job. So it's important that we tend to the whole person. So that's what I really appreciate about this conversation about public health. 
But when it comes to research and it comes to data, I do want to put out a call to action. One of my good friends, Tanya Allen, who's the, uh, I believe, president and CEO of, Tanya, uh, of the Skillman Foundation in Detroit said, data tells a story, but it does not define us. If you really want to get to know about Opportunity Youth, don't just read a report, ask them yourselves. Today, you will hear from young people who will share different experiences, different stories, but that will only scratch the surface. If you were to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with these young people, I'm sure there's a lot more that they could probably offer you. So I ask you, treat them as the experts of their own experience and not as lab rats. Get to know them, build a relationship with them. I looked at the, I observed this community now. There are young people um, within parameters of this actual campus. Um, so with that to say, again, I'm gonna close with again, appreciate you guys for bringing public health into the conversation. If you would like to learn more about Opportunity Youth United, please come talk to me, Shawnice, Kimberly, or our leader, Dorothy Stoneman. Um, and it's been a pleasure to speak with you and it's been a pleasure to work with the young leaders in Baltimore to um, hopefully establish a community action team in this city. Um, so that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. I think what you're gonna hear, LaShawn just really said a lot of these key themes. He had one pathway, but there are multiple pathways, and you're gonna hear these things, especially in our next uh, panel, about some of the key risk and protective factors and some of the reasons why there are these um, populations, disproportionate populations of opportunity youth, because a lot of it caused by the um, fragmentation of our systems. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, and I'd like to have Patrice Cromwell come up. Patrice is going to be our, our moderator for the panel, and I'd like to have all the other panelists come up as well. Um, just to introduce Patrice, she is the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Center of Economic Opportunity at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and has long been involved in addressing the needs of Opportunity Youth. She also recently joined the International Youth Foundation Reconnecting Youth Global Advisory Committee, and she also co-chairs the Economic Wellbeing work, for, work Group of the Youth Transition Funders Group. There's a lot more behind Patrice, and you can read her bio, um, but she has a wealth of experience, and so I'm going to just welcome you all to start um, the symposium. And I'm gonna put up your slides Terrific. as well. Oh, sounds like it's on. Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank many of you who have put this conference together. There's been a huge movement afoot, as LaShawn said, with Opportunity Youth uh, really uh, front and center, and people like Dorothy Stoneman have been uh, really moving in that direction for some time. But it's incumbent upon us um, from a number of institutions, and particularly Hopkins with this Bloomberg Initiative, to step into it as well from a public health perspective. Um, so why is this so important? Uh, there are a couple of slides mm -hmm. that um, I have before this, so maybe if you could mm -hmm. pop that up. Um, well, first, of course, young people are our future, as we know, um, and we're failing them. Um, if we look not just here in the U.S. or very specifically here in Baltimore where we have a very large number of, of opportunity youth who are not connected to school of work, it's true for many countries uh, around the world. And if you take a look at uh, this slide, part of what we think about just if we look at the U.S. where there are about 35 million uh, youth in this 16 to 24 age group, and those numbers are somewhat fungible because really, given some of the uh, market, it's often till 29 or so where youth really feel that sense of permanence um, if they get the support they need to go on a pathway to success. But then if you look at um, those young people that are marginally connected, so they might have a job today, but it might be part-time, then we're talking 14 million young people. Then we say, well, what about opportunity youth who are not today in school and work? Well, that's five million. And then you look at um, a, a core uh, number of youth, and it may be close to about two to three million, um, 
two million of youth that have been involved in either the foster care or the justice system are chronically disconnected. Um, and again, as LaShawn said, many of the institutions that we know of, whether it's the uh, criminal justice system or the foster care system, have failed many of those youth. The, the disparities for youth of color are really uh, significant. And if you look at um, the disproportionality around opportunity youth, if you're black or Hispanic, three to six times higher likelihood of disconnection. So as we think about this work, it's really important in sort of a John Powell uh, perspective to think about universal approaches that have a real targeted universalism, uh, really working toward those young people that have, whether it's system or policy barriers, um, and how we can target our resources and support around them. So this panel is really focused on three things. One, um, to get at the data, to really understand the data. Again, it's one piece of the story, um, as the young leaders talked about and we'll talk about later. Um, that's a huge uh, 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 context for the data. And then second, um, and actually, Rebecca's gonna jump into some really fantastic data, which I haven't seen in all, in one place anywhere else, so I think you'll be excited about that. Um, and then Phil Leaf, um, one of your own here at Hopkins, is gonna talk about some of the risk and protective factors and some of the movements around trauma-informed practice and others. Um, so he'll uh, share a lot from kind of a global perspective, but also very specifically here in Baltimore. And then Thaddeus is going to share, all right, we've seen the data, what are some emerging um, solutions to some of the organizational and policy and system challenges? Because not, as, as young people tell us, we call a, a term, an old fashioned term is disconnected youth. It's really disconnected systems and partners and how can we be more strategic um, and aligned so that those pathways for young people can be seamless. So with that, let me turn to uh, Rebecca and we'll get started. And just so you know, um, Rebecca, Thaddeus, and Phil's bio are on this so you get a sense of the expertise they're bringing today. Thank you. Okay, here you go. Thank um, you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so as LaShawn said earlier, the data just scratches the surface, so I'm just gonna scratch the surface here. <laughs> um, and so my name is Rebecca Gluskin, I'm from Measure of America. Um, before I get to the research, let me just tell you a bit about Measure of America, um, so you can understand where we're coming from and why we care so much about the issue. Measure of America is a nonpartisan project of the Social Science Research Council. We measure what matters for human well-being and provide database tools for understanding opportunity and equality in America. A main focus of ours is to draw the attention to the important and often overlooked indicators of human well-being. Here in the US, we tend to rely a lot on economic indicators and how to use them, um, and how to use them for progress. Economic indicators are everywhere. It's hard not to talk about the gross domestic product, interest rates, housing starts. These numbers answer important questions on how the economy is doing, but economic indicators on their own can't answer an even more important question, how are people doing? We calculate the youth disconnection rate because we think it tells us something incredibly important about uh, who in our society has a chance to build the capabilities and needed to live a freely chosen and rewarding life. Today I'll go through our latest research, First, our, and these are our reports up here. Um, first I'll tell you about the situation at the national level in terms of how young people from rural areas are doing compared to urban and suburban kids, as well as youth from different racial and ethnic groups. Then I'll talk about rates by state and metro area, and I'll conclude with some recommendations. Um, so we heard about the definition. Um, we also define it as uh, youth between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither working nor in school. And why should we care about this issue? There are a few reasons. First, being detached from both educational systems and the labor market during the pivotal years of emerging adulthood is very harmful. This is a time when people develop the capabilities required to live live their life, knowledge and credentials, social skills and networks, a sense of mastery and agency, an understanding of one's strengths and preferences, and the ability to handle stressful events and regulate emotions. 
Second, the effects of youth disconnection can have, sh have been shown to follow the individual for the rest of their lives, resulting in, some, in our data in lower incomes, higher unemployment rates, negative physical and mental health outcomes. And third, the harms accrue not only to the young people, but to the so society at large. Society pays a price in terms of reduced competitiveness, lower tax revenue, higher health, social services, criminal justice, and not even talking about the larger societal effects. So who are these youth? First, oh, sorry, first the good news. <laughs> uh, fewer young, adult, young people are, are disconnected from school and work today uh, than they were before the Great Recession. The 2015 youth disconnection rate, 12.3, is below the 2014 rate of 13.2 and well below the 2010 youth disconnection peak of 14.7 during the Great Recession. It's even below the 2008 rate of 12.6 before the Great Recession hit. Basically, we've seen an 11% drop over five years, which translates to roughly 900,000 young people, uh, fewer young people cut off from pathways. So that's close to a million. <laughs> Um, so one key to this recovery is the unemployment rate has gone from historic highs, during, historic highs during the recession to historic lows in the last couple of years. Let's see. We continue to see huge variation by race and ethnicity at the national level. The Asian American youth disconnection rate of 7.9 percent is the lowest rate among the five major racial and ethnic groups in the United States. This rate translates to about 150,000 young people. Asian Americans are a diverse group, however, uh, so this, you know, this is a monolithic stat right here. Um, the white youth disconnection rate, about 11.3 percent. Uh, whites make up the largest share of the U.S. population and also the largest share, about 4.8 million disconnected youth. Uh, or sorry, and there are about 4.8 million dis yep. mm, yes, okay. Um, I'm sorry, two of the 2,176 uh, young people. Latinos fall in the middle of the group with a rate of about 16.3, and nearly one in five black young youth, youth experience disconnection, um, about 21.6%. This rate translates to about one million black young people who are neither in school nor working. Native American teens and young adults have the highest rate of disconnection, 27.8, uh, more than one in four. Because the Native American population is the smallest of the five major American racial and ethnic groups, the actual number of disconnection youth is, likely, is likewise the smallest, about 74,000. Um, let's see, oh, sorry. And so you can see in 2010, there was the peak, and in 2015, uh, we were seeing a decrease. However, the racial and ethnic groups still seem to stagger at the same rate. And this is stratified by uh, women and men. Um, so as you can see, race and ethnicity by women and men, um, Latinas are the only major group more likely than their brothers to be disconnected, about 15.6% versus 13.1, and black young women are much less likely than their male counterparts to be disconnected, 15.7 versus 21.9. Among whites, Asian Americans, Asians, and Native Americans, the male and female disconnection rates are about the same. Um, so across the country, we see really large uh, differences um, geographically. So these are US counties. Um, the gray areas represent areas that have too small of a population to calculate. Um, but here you can see, this is a, a slide, and the darker the, darker the, the county, the higher the rates of disconnection. So I'm pointing out a few counties where that have some of the lowest in the country. And now we can look at some of the counties that have the highest in the country. Um, and so the question is, what is going on by geography? Um, it's, you know, what is happening in these counties where there's extremely high low rates? Um, and compare these to what's happening in places like Wheeler County, Georgia, or Hamilton County, Florida. So the data does not answer these questions. We're just trying to illuminate, illuminate the questions. Um, oh, excuse me. 
So in the last year's election definitely brought to the surface the question of urban, suburban, and rural divides. Um, Research and advocacy around youth dis disconnection, and ours included, have largely focused on the urban uh, population. For us, the reason has been a technical one. Rural populations typically are too small to allow for reliable calculations. To bypass these limitations imposed by small population size, we pooled five years worth of data for the US counties from the American Community Survey from 2010 to 2014. We then divided the counties into six groups, um, defined by the US Center of Disease Control. And while we still cannot provide estimates for individual rural, rural counties, we can provide an estimate for the sparsely populated rural county, counties in general. So using this method um, of combining counties, we found that rural counties as a whole are faring considerably worse than populous counties in terms of youth disconnection. In completely rural counties, the youth dis disconnection rate is 20.3% much higher than the rate for counties in urban centers, which is 14.2, or for suburban counties, which is 12.3. Rural counties in the south, in particular, are really struggling. Their, our rural disconnection rate is 24%. And of course, this is not to say that there aren't high youth dis disconnection rates in urban areas. Our previous research has found that the largest gaps that exist between different populations are between predominantly low-income black and Latino cities and nearby largely white suburbs. For instance, in greater Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, the disconnection rate for young people living in a few predominantly black neighborhoods was 10 times higher than the rates of youth living in a few nearly all-white neighborhoods. So we, see, we continue to see huge variation by race and ethnicity at the national level. The Asian American youth disconnection rate, the lowest rate among the five, um, is translated to about 150,000 young people. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, by state. Sorry, this is by state. Um, my little icons are not working. So the highest rate for whites um, on average across the states is the lowest, is lower than the average black disconnection rate. So this is to drive home the point that there really is um, racial and ethnic groups that are faring far worse than the national average. Um, and that even in, in some of the states such as Montana, um, you see really low white youth disconnection rates, but then really high black disconnection rates. And that combining Poverty um, and race is a really, um, as you see, really interesting and detrimental effects. So higher income among Native American youth are as likely, um, are as likely to be disconnected as poor white youth. Um, and then higher income among black youth are as likely to be as di disconnected as poor Asian youth. Um, and these regression, uh, this um, regression across the lines shows that these lines don't cross each other. So we don't even see um, a mix of poverty and race in this slide. Um, finally, what we did was we wanted to look at segregation um, in neighborhoods and high rates of youth disconnection. So we did a study of change over time in clusters of neighborhoods, and we found that rates of disconnection by neighborhood in 2000 were highly predictive of rates of youth disconnection by neighborhood uh, in 2011, even controlling for population growth and demographic change. Um, and, oops, sorry. We found that the more segregated blacks and whites are from one another within a metro area, the lower the likelihood of youth disconnection is among whites, but the higher among blacks. So we tested this. Using a statistical model to examine the relationship between place and race in metro areas, uh, we, we, stud we found that the more segregated blacks and whites are from one another within a metro area, the lower the likelihood of youth disconnection is among whites, but the higher the likelihood is among back blacks. And place matters, race matters, but our analysis shows that the combination of the two creates dramatically different consequences for black and white youth especially. Um, and so this is a map of New York City. Um, so what you can see, um, so as a part of the White House-led data accessibility project, um, MOA and other NGOs gained access to data from the US departments and, and agencies. We looked at youth disconnection in geographies um, using what's 
from the HUD uh, designed racially and ethnic concentrated areas of poverty. So these, are, these recaps are defined as census tracts, which whites make up less than 50% of the population, and the poverty rate is over 40% or more. So in this figure, the shapes outlined in white are the recaps. The youth disconnection rates shown in blue, uh, shown in the darker areas, um, correspond to higher rates of youth disconnection. It is clear that in New York metropolitan area, the youth disconnection rate is nearly all highly segregated areas and high poverty rates. In order to investigate the opposite side of the dichotomy, we created a new geographic descriptor, the white areas of wealth, or anti-recaps. These areas shown in red um, on the map have a non-Hispanic white population of at least 50%, and at least 40% of the households have a median average income of 200,000. In New York metro area, sorry, slip, these wealthy white areas tend to have lower rates of youth disconnection. While some anti-recaps are located in areas with higher disconnection rates, it is not possible to know if the rates are high within the wealthy white track or within the neighborhood. Regardless, this map paints a fairly clear picture. Segregated low-income minority neighborhoods tend to have higher rates, uh, while segregated high-income white neighborhoods tend to have lower rates. And this is a map of Chicago as well. <coughs> Um, so what needs to be done? When we first started this work about 10 years ago, we were struck by how few rigorous evaluations of, of opportunity youth programs that there were, and were alarmed that of the few, most found little or no evidence that the programs had real long-term effects. Um, so we are hoping that this forum will bring together more rigorous evidence of programming, and my, I hope my colleagues uh, can talk more about that. Um, and so this is just the data. We invite you to come take a look. There's a lot of resources there. Um, and we are happy to be a part of this group. Thank you. So we, we're inviting Phil up. Um, we are trying yeah, <laughs> <here for> <laughs> um, and he's been a big part of the movement, as I mentioned earlier, with um, a number of the young leaders, Dorothy Stoneman, and many of the national groups, including the forum. Um, we are going to have uh, time for questions, but certainly if they're clarifying questions during any of the presentations, please just raise your hand. We want to make sure it's interactive or address any issues. So, so we've heard an outline of the fact that we're doing better. You know, there's fewer unemployed youth than there were right before the recession. Uh, but if you're black, if you're living in a, an area where you're primarily black people live in there, you have much higher rates, regardless of where in the U.S. you live. So um, this was so I'm going to be talking about you know, risk and protective factors, uh, moving beyond blaming the victim. I think the original title says that we, we are part of the problem. Uh, so uh, those who are uh, over 35 or 40, can you just raise your hands in the room? Forty. Okay. Uh, I, I, I get much more rewarded for writing articles and promoted and other things on little esoteric differences and minor variations in information than the two, uh, the two days I spent staffing the mayor on her promoting um, her call to, to action, which was working with community folks. We need to re-change the reward system for whether it's academics and other kind of folks, are essentially, we will continue to have wonderful esoteric articles. We will generate people, I, I think, you know, we have a wonderful associate director who was a health commissioner, worked in the federal government. Uh, he sometimes probably longs for the days when he can actually have a real impact because he supervised staff, could make a decision, and, and really in Baltimore did have, have a big impact on what he was doing. So it's not that we don't have people come through our universities and schools who don't have a change, but I think we all live in our communities. We all have an important role in our communities, not as academic people, but people living in these communities. Uh, and I think it's working with the young people, listening to them, listening to our own children, uh, to figure out how we can be doing these things. Uh, now, there's, you know, this is sort of, you know, we have individual factors, relationships, community, societal. It's a lot easier to do research on the individual level. You can go out and do a study, you get 15, 20 people. You, with a perfectly good qualitative study, you might have to get hundreds of people. Uh, you can get your research assistants to collect those data. You can generate publications. And so we get more and more nuanced variations on how bad the world is for people. 
Uh, as we heard briefly, and we're going to hear a lot more today, racism, structural inequities, lack of access. Baltimore City has the second longest commuting distance to get to work than any place in the United States. Anybody know where the first longest commuting distance is? LA. LA. You know, because we don't have a transportation system and none of the jobs are in Baltimore, or most of the jobs are not in Baltimore. So people are commuting almost as much as it takes you to get to LA. There's lots of jokes about how hard it is to get to LA. You know, it's a travesty in, 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 in Baltimore. Uh, so why are we interested in a public health problem? If you look at the reds across the top, homicide is the leading cause of death for 15 to 34-year-olds blacks, uh, and the second leading cause of death to one to four and 10 to 14. People are dying. You know, if that's not a public health problem, uh, you know, what, I don't know what is. On the other hand, health is going cl doing clinical services. Public health is removing the risk factors, increasing the assets, and promoting these things. Uh, we're not going to get there by having wonderful services after people uh, get hurt, get traumatized. Uh, there's a school in Baltimore that's had 11 young people killed in the last 18 months in one school. You know, yes, we can have great support systems after the next kid gets killed, or we got to figure out how to stop those kids from getting killed. Uh, this is a picture. Anybody know who Freddie is? Okay. And what, what's unusual about this picture? Probably different than any other picture you've seen about the uprising. It says, get well, Freddie Gray. Does that seem like a picture that you... When did you start seeing about Freddie Gray and pictures and news covered? After he died. You know, um, you know, this, unfortunately, he was on life support. The young girl didn't know, know that. He was on life support from the day he got into the hospital. Uh, but you know, we got to get upstream in some of the things that are being talked about. And, and I just point this out is because this is a picture I took. I mean, there are people in our institutions that have connections with these folks. Uh, you know, how to, you know, we have a lot of young people here. Part of this is because of our Center for Adolescent Health and working with the health department that's really not just taking youth as an advisory group, but saying, you know, youth have to, you know, they know better what they need. Now, we need to understand that. They can't necessarily translate that into the bureaucracies, but we need to be understanding what they see as the solutions and help working on them as, as the solutions. Uh, my friend, uh, Paul Gregory Harris uh, from Ngoma, in did these things. Our, in Baltimore, we don't have five pathways, so maybe we need to expand some. But we also need to change our metaphors. You know, we're, we need to have these pathways to success, and there's lots of opportunities, unfortunately. We've got a barrier in the front before people can even get into the, the job things. They don't graduate, or we graduate people from Baltimore City who still can't read which makes it not good to get a, get a job even if you have a degree. Or why do I need to come? I, you know, none of my friends have jobs, you know, so we have lots of people dropping out who would have graduated within six or eight, month, eight weeks, literally. You know, several young people who just stopped coming, saying, well, you know, doing that. We have all these young people and other risk factors going to, to for-profit or community colleges with huge debts and coming out with, yes, the two-year degree, and. Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in in debt uh, that they need to be paying off. Uh, these are part of the structural things that we really need to be changing in terms of creating these opportunities. And we've been focusing on sort of three pathways in, in Baltimore. One is the education pathway, getting people back on uh, throughout their entire life. Uh, the second is traditional employment, but increasingly we're also getting interested in entrepreneurial pathways. That what are the you know that, that we're seeing more and more people we talked about small businesses was alluded to uh, there's a lot of people who are creating their own businesses particularly young people that are creating those on, on their own businesses but how do we create the financial supports for them when you the, what the data are showing is that people have less access to assets and then therefore it's more difficult for them to create their own business or they're one or two paychecks away from essentially being losing their housing losing their renting uh, we have programs where if you don't pay your child support, uh, you lose your license, and when you get pulled, up, pulled over for driving while black, you therefore get, pill, you know, get your car gets confiscated because you've moved three times. The notice that you lost your license uh, didn't even get to you, so you're surprised when you get pulled over and the police say, we're, confound, you know, we're confiscating your car, there's, the, you know, there's a bill for that, and it's going to be $150 a day also for every day that it's being in, in the impound. We have, these are structural problems. These are, these are rules, 
and regulations policies that are continuing to disadvantage poor and particularly black people uh, in, in, in Baltimore and elsewhere. Now, uh, just a, some local data. Uh, in the United States, it was sort of talked about, here's the rates uh, of disconnected youth, the national average. Uh, you can see Baltimore doesn't have the highest rate, so this is not just an urban problem. Uh, the jobs have moved away from rural areas also. Uh, but, you know, we have, so we have a number of, of, of counties in Baltimore City that, that are uh, above the national average. So this is um, the uh, local area. You can sort of see the box there. That's Baltimore City. Yellow is better, uh, darker, uh, yellow is worse, darker is better, meaning that there's more opportunities there. And this is looking at a composite of education, job availability, average income, housing prices, other things. All things have been shown to be related to either not having a job if you're a young person or, or having a job. And as we're pointing out in the earlier presentation, are more affluent neighborhoods also have more of their children working. They probably go to work part-time or just volunteering in their child, their parents' jobs, uh, you know, with summer jobs and things, or they hire each other uh, in terms of summer jobs. They get jobs experience. They're able to move th through these things, even if they're unpaid jobs, because they're, they're increasing their, their resumes. Young people in Baltimore need to bring in money, because they actually are, many of them are paying for their rent, uh, paying for their food and their families. Uh, uh, and there's lots of these risk factors. They are all congregating in the same communities. Uh, so again, we can do studies on each one of these things, but we also then need to be moving. And this is what public health does. Public health creates policies that are, that are cross-cutting. They don't just focus on getting better health services. They try to think about you know, how, do, how do you create transportation? How do you create opportunities? How do you promote positive development, not just deal with, with problems? Uh, and so there's lots of things that need to get worked on, but when you, the researchers are looking at these things, they sort of all are congregating in the same neighborhoods, uh, in the same areas, and I'm gonna present a little bit data for this. Another thing that we're getting increasingly aware of is uh, two things, brain development. Uh, most young people don't have fully developed brains till their mid-20s, but also the negative factors in terms of trauma, uh, adverse life experiences that they encounter during childhood have persistent problems and challenges as they both age and then even intergenerationally. So the more people, more of these adverse childhood experiences you have, both in terms of physical illnesses, but also in terms of experiencing trauma, as well as being a perpetrator of trauma, uh, you're much more likely to do these things. And as you can see from these data, Baltimore has higher rates for each of these individually. Death of parents, uh, witnessing violence, having someone with a mental health or suicidal in your family, uh, living with somebody who has a, a drug or alcohol problem, uh, having people who have been separated or divorced or, nev or, or never having lived with, with one of your parents or more of your parents. Uh, and, and, and so uh, looking at, the, these are you know, recent data from our CAMI uh, group in, 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 uh, at, at Hopkins, but you can sort of see uh, much higher rates both nationally, uh, and one of the things that's happening is the rates are, you know, the, these events are going up and, and, and increasing. Now one of the things, uh, and Pat Sharkey actually presented on this yesterday at a, at a different Bloomberg supported uh, initiative, uh, he looked at the number of volunteer nonprofit groups that were in different, different communities, uh, and then looked at changes in murder rate, violent crime, and property crime. And one of the things that he found is the more different programs that were going on, whether it's focusing on crime prevention, neighborhood development, substance abuse programs, workforce development, youth organizations, the more sort of NGOs, community-based programs that we have working with those problems, they have a positive impact on all the murder, violent crime, and property crime. He was not looking at disengaged number of youth who are not employed, but I'm willing to bet that it also had, you know, because these things are all related. Uh, that, so, so again, thinking about programs, it's not just the public policies, it's what we do as volunteers, it's how we're spending our time. The, these have demonstrable positive impacts on population level outcomes. Uh, and it means that also as you sort of graduate from here, uh, go out in your communities, it's important to continue doing these things, not just as a, you know, it's something you're doing as a student for volunteering your time to get personal experiences, but being involved in your community, being involved in your child's school. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily as a formal person you're heading your, your community association, it's just sort of showing up. It's just sort of being there, and we have evidence that these, these, these non-governmental organizations, these nonprofits have very positive impacts. Uh, another thing that's being uh, alluded to, that was alluded to and, and, and also the thing is, so in the U.S., 64% of the population is white. 
you know, much higher percentage, you know, much lower percentage are actually incarcerated in jail. Uh, if we had the arrest data, it'd be, you know, it'd sort of be in, in between. If you, ha if you have a criminal record, it's harder for you to get a job. Uh, now, in many jurisdictions, we've taken the checkbox off so that you're not, you're not checking it off so it's not literally there at the front end. Uh, but, you, but it is much harder. Now, you'll hear a very good, from, from Chris Wilson uh, this evening, an example of a really brilliant individual who spent time in jail. Obviously, made, he will talk about his mistakes, but, but the difficulties he had initially of getting work and things are, again, structural problems that, 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 that we're putting in place. Um, the point here is not so much what individual counties are, but look at what the dark, the just where the dark things are located. Uh, if you remember the previous uh, presentation where there was more disengaged youth, you'll, you'll notice that things are darker here. This is the number, percentage of all students who received an out-of-school suspension. Out-of-school suspensions are very strong indicators both for not graduating, which partially is being you know, disengaged youth, are not getting a job if you do, do graduate. And you can sort of see, here's the number of youth who are suspended. Now here are the number uh, who are black students who receive one or more suspensions by, by district. And, increase, and here even, here are students with disabilities who receive one or more suspensions. In theory, children with students with disabilities, they've got identified with a disability. They should be getting services to allow them to, to, to stay in school. Uh, and being suspended in school across all studies is a very strong indicator of not graduating. Uh, so we are, again, we've created this mechanism, you know, special edge programs. Uh, but they're, they're less likely to graduate and they're more likely to be suspended uh, even after being in those programs. Uh, so again, how do we change our policies and practices? Some Baltimore data also, this is um, data that my, my, one of my postdocs, uh, Stacy Williams did. Uh, and you can sort of see the same thing in all these patterns. Regardless of what our risk factor is, uh, and, and in this case, the, 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 the red the group, the red stars are uh, the percentage of students who are entering school ready to learn, with red being the low number uh, and green being the high number. And then the colored community uh, statistical areas, lighter is lower infant mortality rate, higher, is, darker is, is higher infant mortality rate. The, the one on the right is third graders. Uh, and you sort of see not entering school ready to learn. Those schools are also having more problems. The same neighborhoods are, are not having students graduate. Uh, we also look at child welfare. They're like, more likely to have child, child welfare uh, children, children in the child welfare system. Uh, and those factors, the number of children in these neighborhoods are very highly related to neighborhood disadvantage, violence in the neighborhood, and drug and alcohol use of the adults in the neighborhood. Again, we're having these cluster of problems. Having a service that's just focusing on one of these things are not gonna get us out of the way. Here's, here, you are in the middle of this place. This is our Johns Hopkins you know, Health System campus. Uh, the, um, these are sort of the, the red thing, the red colored in things are the homicides uh, within either a quarter mile or a half mile. Uh, the others are shootings. Uh, one of the reasons we, you know, that one just looking at, you're living in this neighborhood, and that's, and that, you know, that's the number of non-fatal shootings or homicides within a reasonably short period of time. You know, uh, you know, January 16th uh, to through June 7, 2017. Uh, so imagine the people again living in those neighborhoods. Uh, besides us having trauma responses and other things to be able to respond to them. There are schools that are very close, in, literally, in those, those neighborhoods. So it's not, again, as an institution, even if we only care about, yeah, you know, we definitely are the best school of public health. We have one of the best medical schools. We, I think we have rated as the best nursing school. Our hospital has, has for years, been one of the top three or, or, or four. Uh, so we're providing services, uh, but how do we get together with the prevent, prevention, promotion, and also dealing with the trauma that these people are experiencing after the incident that that trauma does not go away automatically. And when you have multiple of these things, it's yes, you know, well, there's an area where there's only one of these things. Well, you know, this is blocks where you have three or four murders, and these aren't necessarily, you know, the four people got shot the same day. These are over periods of time. So back to, you know, getting well soon, uh, you know, what we need to be doing is figuring out how do we work with and listen to and support the young people in the community? What are the things that they are identifying as being most important in their lives, both the strengths and assets? Because we have sitting in this room people who are, have real strengths and assets. They are doing wonderful things. They know of other young people that are doing wonderful things. They know of neighbors. They know of services and institutions that have helped them. Some of them it's their faith community. Some of times it's their neighborhood association. Many 
times it is their school. And that's why we're putting in after school programs and other kinds of schools. Because if your parent is leaving at 6, 6.30 in the morning to get to her job, and not getting back till seven o'clock, you know, they're working eight hours, but it takes you two and a half hours to get to your job. That means we have huge numbers of young people in, in our communities who, you know, parents would love to be there. Uh, they would love to be able to only have to have a half hour commute uh, to be able to pick up their child after work or maybe pick up their child and take them back to work as some people in this room have done in the past and do if the schools are closed. They bring their children into school. The kind of jobs, the people we're talking about, they don't have those kind of jobs. They're not allowed to bring their children into, 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 into work. So how do we create those institutions, whether it's a, 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 as, a, as an anchor institution, the university and the hospital does it within our neighborhood, or as a public health institution, we work on those kind of things. Those are all things that we're gonna hear a little bit more about, sort of, sort of some of the, you know, sort of the services and, and the entities in the, in the next thing. But we really need to be moving beyond just individual risk factors to thinking about how we're really dealing with the, the problem and the collective impact. And then uh, just one other thing about data. Um, so these are data, and the point I want to be making, so if you look at that little P there, that's actually a police station. And if, when we looked at the actual reports of incidences uh, and victims, uh, you can see that's red, very high. We don't really think 32 people had violent crimes at the police station. Uh, now, some of we, knowing some of the police, we may have had some violent crimes at the police station, but it's not the main place. So part of the issue also is looking at what the data is doing, how, where it's coming from, uh, and, 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 and how, how it's being dealt with. So I think. I just thought we would pause for a second. That's a ton of data and slides. Um, really helpful information. I think a couple of themes um, just wanted to emphasize that both um, Rebecca and Phil talk about just the huge amount of disparities. Uh, disparities by gender, by race, ethnicity, by place and neighborhood, by poverty and income and by whether a community is segregated or not. Um, additionally, how we have to look at solutions um, with many of you in a very holistic, whole person perspective, as LaShawn mentioned, and really address uh, issues like trauma and the experiences the young people had. So just wanted to pause if there are one or two questions, and then Thaddeus is gonna give sort of the bigger picture in terms of organizations and systems. Um, but any immediate questions or clarifications? It's a quiet group today. <laughs> um, well, please put your hand up if you have so, because it's much more helpful for us to hear what's on your mind as well. Dorothy. <laughs> So, so it, those were all at least statistically significant changes. So, at Pat Sharkey, I mean, I can, I have this Go ahead. Yeah. I think, in the in the reference. So, it's a published, he presented yesterday, but it was on a pub, also based on an article that he's published. And part of what it was is increasing the number uh, of, of programs. What they found in a number of communities, as they not just put in service programs, they have more people on the ground because most of these NGOs are, are working with actually having relationships with people. So part of the, what they thought the mechanism was, and it didn't matter whether you're getting relationships because it was a youth development program, or because you were trying to work, it was a reentry program, or because you're working with education, or for food, or having a beautiful neighborhood, because the, that, that essentially you were, they, the, the programs were working with real people and then trying to figure out how to support them. Uh, and, and, and so they had across the various sorts of violent crime uh, had, had positive impacts. So it was really just the presence of people deliberately making a difference changed a little bit of the context to change the outcomes, which is kind of extraordinary. Yeah, and it's good data to show what many around this room are doing is having a positive impact. We often don't talk about the positive impacts. Well, let's do one more question, then we'll turn to Thaddeus. Please stand up and tell us who you are. Thank you. 
differently. Um, one of the things that was interesting and sort of concerning to me is that it, it seems that you posit that there isn't much difference d despite affluence. And I, I can't imagine that that's, that that's true. I can't imagine that affluent African Americans are likely to become disconnected as those who are less affluent. And I don't think that's what you said. However, that's sort of how it was delivered. And so those are sort of multiple questions. Have you crosswalked the data um, with Raj Chen's data? And also, what were you actually saying in terms of uh, the economic disparities and how they affect uh, people's disconnection? Mm -hmm. Those are great questions, thank you. Um, so regarding Raz Chetty's work, um, we have not crosswalked our work with his. Um, it's really fascinating work and um, he uses slightly different data sets so we'd love to sort of mesh those together and see what happens. Um, regarding the effects of poverty and race, yeah, it, exactly, we, we're not saying that poverty doesn't affect disconnection, um, but what, what the data was showing at the national level um, is that both the combination of poverty and race have different effects among the different groups. So you can't just take poverty out of the equation and everything is equal. Or you can't just take race out of the equation and everything is equal. It's that the combination of the two has um, different effects among different groups. Um, and so we were trying to show that in a graph and data and graphs don't even, don't even do it justice. So that was a great question. Thanks for clarifying. Terrific. Um, that's very helpful clarification on the data. Let me turn to Thaddeus Ferber from the Forum for Youth Investment. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I am really excited to be here uh, with all of you today. Uh, I just keep reflecting back five, ten years ago. We wouldn't have a School of Public Health knowing about Opportunity Youth, let alone having a big event and series of symposia around it. And we certainly wouldn't have had all these amazing, great people in this room who are working on Opportunity Youth. Um, I really do think that the public health um, perspective and tools are critically important to this population, some of which was alluded to by uh, the previous speakers. And I'll pick up right where the discussion left off, which was, um, Dorothy's question about uh, Phil's slide on the number of nonprofits. When we look at the evidence base behind any one particular program, and this is not just for opportunity youth, it's pretty much for any population, it's generally pretty limited, the result that you can find, which can be demoralized. You're at this amazing program, you see these bright young people and how energized they are, and then you do the actual randomized control uh, trial, and it may be significantly significant, but that doesn't mean it's significantly significant. Um, if you're, you're trying to make it so in communities um, within the country where you have a less than average chance of making it in this world, what can you do to make young people, help those young people in those communities have above average chance of making it? So this was um, a different type of counting with is just counting the number of assets in a young person's life and showing very directly, right, if you're in the significantly significant world when you're doing a chart like this, you want a line like that. Um, this is amazing of if you just count, I don't even know too much about specifically which of those good things are. We pick those good things and add them up. If you have close to 25 of them, it doesn't matter what race or ethnicity you are or even what community you live in, you're not gonna have high risk behaviors. Now, we know the communities that you live in affect directly how many assets you have. We really can now see um, that um, this work, we're actually uh, very excited. It's been uh, the guru of it is in this room, uh, Rico Catalano. Um, so if you want to learn more about this type of data or approach, you've got the nation's um, expert right here with us today. So summing up the evidence um, is what I've heard equipped as, well, nothing works, but everything might. No one program works enough. There are programs that work. You've got Youth Building Europe and other programs that work, but not enough to say you are definitely going to have above average chance of making it uh, if, you, if we adjust nothing else in your life other than this one program. So 
Uh, the desired goals of overall youth development are difficult, if not impossible, to achieve within the bounds of a single intervention unless that intervention is, in reality, not a single program, even a comprehensive one, but a reasonably complex strategy to change young people's environments and opportunities structure. So the programs that do the best are the programs that are comprehensive and do the most to change young people's environments and opportunity um, structures out there. Um, this type of challenge, I think, is one of those that's well attuned to public health, where you are looking not just at one program, but you're looking across a community um, as a range of factors that cumulatively add up to the likelihood of a young person making it or not. So the challenge with creating a reasonably complex strategy is it's reasonably complex to do that. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, look at what some of the complexities that it takes um, to do that. So if you're trying to change policies, as Phil said, there's a range of different policies um, out there. Uh, this is Kentucky state government, but every government, local city, federal government looks like this. So um, the good news is chances are somewhere in there is exactly what an opportunity youth needs. Um, they probably could use help in a range of areas, vocationally, academically, health, mental health. Somewhere in that is someone in government whose job it is to provide those things. No one can figure out how the heck you access any of those things. Um, this has been done not just with like young people, but they've brought in members of Congress with fancy law degrees and plop, here's the eligibility forms for you to complete, and they couldn't complete them um, either. Um, the result is, unsurprisingly, kind of a mess. So this is at the county level in Los Angeles County where they said, well, let's map out all the different um, uh, service areas, and then within each department, what are the specific programs that could affect a young person, and it's a mess. Um, there is stuff there. We don't know how much. It's completely disorganized. We're not sure what to do with that. And so what programs try to do is, can I cobble together enough of those government funding sources to bring it together into a reasonably complex strategy to change young people's um, lives? I'm going to pause on this um, slide for one um, extra minute here, which is that I've spent a lot of my career really working on this fragmentation issue. Um, equally important and now extremely much more important is there isn't enough funding in general. Even if we took everything we had and put it together the best we know how, we know how there's just not enough of it. And with the tax bill that has, is about to be passed, there's going to be a trillion dollars added to our deficit, which means Congress is going to come back and say, we now need to live within our means. How are we going to cut back on programs? We can't cut back. Well, they'll try to, but it's harder to cut back on entitlement programs. They don't want to cut back on military. So all of, all of those programs are going to be severely cut or eliminated. So just as context for that, you'll be hearing from speakers later to the day about it while I now continue on to the whatever size of government is, the less fragmentation, it's still going to be a challenge. But it's not the most important challenge right now, but it's still an important challenge that I think public health has a lot to say about. All right, so you've got all these programs on the ground saying, oh, I see all these different funding streams for different government agencies. I want a comprehensive program that does all these things. I'm going to apply for all those funds, put it together in one thing. And the question is, can, that comes up is, well, that's great, but am I even allowed to do that? The answer ten turns to be, as we look into it, is about a third of the time you actually can do the things that you wanted to do, but because you're in a bureaucratic government system, you assume you can't do it. There's no easy way to say, hey, here's the comprehensive program I want to do. Government at various levels, can you tell me am I allowed to do it in this way or not? It's very hard to even figure it out. When they've had organized waiver processes that have given a great way for programs to say, am I allowed to do this? About a third of the time, the result, once the government plows through all the regs to find out, about a third of the time is the answer is yes. 
but you won't get to that yes unless you had this process of finding it. About two thirds of the time you can't, you would need additional flexibility to do that. So programs struggle to contort themselves because with each of those different federal funding streams or government funding streams at all levels, along with the money comes a lot of specific requirements and compliance steps about what you have to do. And so these programs have to kind of look like I'm a drug prevention program on one day and a dropout prevention program on another day and just a good positive youth development program and try to account for each of those dollars from each of those services and actually make all that stuff somehow try to be cohesive and coherent in a young person's life. So we worked to try and figure out, well, can we flip that narrative? Instead of having programs contort themselves to fit with government requirements, who we force government requirements to contort themselves to serve local programs? And that is what we were able to do with uh, a policy called the Performance Partnership Pilots. For this is focused on disconnected youth, where we got Congress to agree that for up to 10 places a year, a place could be a community, a city, a county, a state, a cluster of states, um, could come back to the federal government and have any policy waived if that's creating a barrier to your implementing a comprehensive opportunity youth program or system. Um, there are limitations. This one is only for discretionary programs, not just for entitlement um, programs. Um, you do still have to be held accountable, but instead of being held accountable for compliance to each of those little rules that we made you do, now instead we're going to keep you accountable by looking at results. Okay? We're going to give you flexibility in how you use the money, and we need to see at the end that we're getting good results um, on the side of that. All right, so what did we learn from this, that process and a number of other place-based um, initiatives, opportunity works that um, Patrice and others have done, There's a, and the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, I think I saw Monique um, in the room of 24 communities trying to unsilo um, these efforts going on. Um, what have we learned that uh, relates to the data and research that um, we're about to go into a breakout to discuss? The first is, when I said things were complicated, I'm gonna go into a little bit more specificity. This is from FSG discussing different types of societal issues that we grapple with um, together. There are simple problems like baking a cake that at least most of us, there's instructions, they're not too hard instructions, you follow those instructions, you get a cake. Um, there are complicated issues like sending a rocket to the moon, lots and lots of little pieces but you can 100% uh, uh, know that if you put that rocket together in the exact same way at the exact same time, it's gonna have the same result. But then there's a different type of problem that they refer to as complex problems like, or problem isn't the right term here, but raising a child, right? We can't tell you, although I'd love to have one, if anyone has one, please give it to me. Here's what you do on the first day, here's what you do on the second day, here's on the third day, right? There is a lot that is known and research can share about ways to raise a child, but it can't be a specific formula for doing that. We found the same thing with communities. When we're trying to help a community have a lot of those great assets, decrease a lot of those crimes and other bad outcomes, um, we can't give you a, you need nine of this program, six of this program, this thing over there. Okay, every community is different. We can give good ideas and guidance and thoughts, but specifically how it's gonna to come together in a community has to be an interactive, engaged community process. Um, what we found is as people are doing that, the lifeblood of that is some way for them to know, is this what we're doing working or not? Okay, there needs to be some sort of way for people to get feedback on is the, the various clusters of things that people are trying to do, is it working? Um, we, I've heard this referred to as if you were going bowling and there's in the middle a curtain and you bowl the ball and then it goes by the curtain and you then have no idea did you hit any bowling, any bowling pins or not, there's no way to improve or self-correct or self-adjust. So 
along with the flexibility, and we have some ideas for you, but you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself to agree in your community. We need to have some way for them to know how many pins got knocked down in the various strategies they took. So as we're thinking about evidence and science and public health, um, one area of work that I think is good for this group to look into, it's called complexity science. I'll, say, I'll give you a very long two sentences run on um, about it. But this, I think, categorizes um, what we are collectively trying to make happen. Under conditions of complexity, predetermined solutions can neither be reliably ascertained nor implemented. There is no one single solution to these problems, and even if a solution were known, no one individual or organization is in a position to compel all the players involved to adopt it. Important variables that influence the outcome are not and often cannot be known or predicted in advance. Under these conditions of complexity, predetermined solutions rarely succeed. So there is a path forward, even though it's complex and complicated, um, there is a body of research and action that may be well-tuned for um, helping us in this field move forward. Regardless, for all of that, as I pointed out, you need to know how many pins there are left at the end of the day, and so you still need good data. Um, now, with policies being fragmented and programs being fragmented, data is also, thank you, we're with me. So when you're talking about disconnected youth, there's a whole sort, a whole bunch of information and databases and records, school records, court records, IRS records, earned income tax credit records. There's lots and lots of data in lots of bite siloed ways that make it harder often than easier for a community to get a sense of how are we doing with opportunity youth. Um, as uh, a uh, person in Oakland uh, city government, Jose Cordano said, we can collect data all day long, but it's not coordinated, it's not synced up, and it's not attached to outcomes. So part of, I think, what the conversation will have to have collectively today and beyond is, what does it mean, what does it look like to get it coordinated, synced up, and attached to outcomes? I always wanna leave on something of a, of a up note, um, which is, there have been a range of important innovations recently in this challenge of there's lots of different data out there and we don't know how the heck to bring it together and use it. Um, and uh, efforts that have come to support various reasons you would want integrated data. The first is for case management. Um, this is Casebook brought together, um, created by the Casey Foundation, now spun off as its own entity of how can we make something like a Facebook type profile process for foster care children that I'm trying to um, support, right? And so behind the scenes, getting in, oh, I'm gonna go talk to them. Did they go to the hospital? Did they make it into school? Having that all done for them in a convenient interface makes caseworkers much more empowered to do the work that they're trying to do. The next is for, for performance management. This is a draft screenshot of the equity intelligence platform that um, Bloomberg Associates and Pub, uh, Policy Link and the My Brother's Keeper Alliance put together, which was saying, all right, we're getting the picture. It's a lot of things in a community that all add up. How do I, in say a mayor's office, know how we're doing? with lots of things in a way. And so this basically takes what Fortune 500 CEOs have of a data analytics platform and brings it in to opportunity youth and equity more broadly in, in this particular case. And then lastly, you need this integrated data to do high quality research. Um, if you wanna know, did an opportunity youth initiative work and you're looking over time, wouldn't it be great to be able to know five years out how much money do they make? What kind of job do they have? We, government has that. The IRS has that type of information. There's huge sensitivities, obviously, in who's allowed to access it. Um, but the, um, there was a evidence commission, a bipartisan evidence commission that just completed its work and created a report. And one of the recommendations is to create a secure data access lab or center where a researcher could say, here's the young people that I worked with, here's the um, 
social security records, we're gonna hand it up to you. You're then behind the scenes gonna connect to the various um, firmly protected federal databases and give back to you not the personal information that we're not allowed to do, but we'll be able to tell you, okay, here's the people in your control group, here's the people who went to your, the program or initiative, and then five, 10 years out, here's how much money as an aggregate each of those people uh, made. So to sum up, no one magic bullet, lots of things have to happen together. Um, there are increasingly government is trying to figure out the ways to adapt to that we need lots of stuff happening together and government's not set up to have lots of things coming together. There are innovations in that side. The data has to be integrated. There are innovations on this side. Um, and then to conclude, I know that this is a solvable problem and I know that it's a solvable problem because we made, this is a problem that we made by we, I can specifically say white males, right? We, what did we think would happen when we take people, enslave them for generation on generation and generation, we don't let them learn, uh, allow them to learn how to read or write, we don't let them stay as a family unit, we divide them and divide them and divide them, and then we say, okay, you're free, but you're only allowed to live literally within this red line, right? Where did Freddie Gray live? Within the red line. Where are those maps, the clusters, right, of the places with the, the, they're in those red lines? And there are also, there's always lots of talk about congressional districts being gerrymandered. Take a look at how school district maps, right? There was a Supreme Court ruling during the busing period which said that um, courts could force you to bus kids within a school district, but they couldn't force you to bus kids across the school district. So guess what all the white communities did? All the white upperly mobile people were gonna create a crazy school goo thing, house by house, boom, you're a school district. School districts not only are where you go to school, school districts are a taxing entity. And so being a locally driven income tax school system, by doing squiggly lines, we say, okay, you people are gonna be able to afford to put money into your public school. These people didn't. You see that exact same types of line in the end results, okay? We created this problem, we can solve it. Thank you. Well, we've heard um, some impressive presentations, some terrific data to get a sense of what is the data behind the stories. Some of the uh, young leaders, both LaShawn talking earlier and some of our young leaders we'll talk about later. Um, and then dug into some of the risk and protective factors. And I think Thaddeus' emphasis on the system and the fragmentation and what we've created and how um, we think about moving forward really very comprehensively um, and to address complexity, you have to be very iterative and adaptive. And so how we together work together to build, um, build on a movement that's already underway. So with that, let me um, turn it to you. I know there's some questions out there of our experts. There are also some experts in the room that might want to comment. So please, we have about 15, 20 minutes. Please, uh, yes, gentleman in front. If you could just um, say your name, too. Caucasian Americans, 
with Asian Americans, and it's already divided. Even in the way the data is, uh, thank you, is demonstrated when it's light, it's positive. When it's dark, it's negative. Uh, you know, so how we use language matters. Um, we're talking about um, presentation, uh, the markers that we use to, to talk about health disparities. How do we change this uh, with the, all the community engagement? Whatever we put in, uh, in the system to help the communities we're talking about, a lot of times we, we, we give a help for an hour or two hours, but what does the community use when we're not there? <coughs> They also use their faith, and that's never brought up. How does their faith, I work with ex-offenders, young people in general, black people believe in God, or they believe in Allah or Buddha, as well as white people, or whoever else they might be. And so if we're gonna be changing and engaging people where they are, if we're gonna offer service for two hours or three hours a week, what are they using when they're not with us? That's part of the part, what they use is their faith, but we never address it in our, our um, presentations, and that's powerful if you want to see people's change in general. Um, how do we change this thing? A Time to Kill is a great movie. Something happened. And you know, you said white male created this. It is true. White male still created this. And it's not a blame for today's male, but if you have generational uh, income of 60%, 65% of Americans are white, 13% or 11% are black, so 3% or 10% of black males will be equal to three people. It's not the same thing as the percentage can be skewed too. 25% of 10 people versus 25% of 100 people is a different type of numbering. I think we have to really highlight the percentage in terms of numbers as well. And so my question is how do we get from, say, identifying these pockets of people into saying, we gotta be the one to fix it, like you said. We gotta think, the majority has the money, we, the schooling, the majority lends, has the banking, so Asians, America are less, because they get loans to start businesses. It's not easy for black people to get loans to start those same businesses. Taxes are higher in the city than in the suburbs. Uh, a house in Howard County or in the rural area uh, is a lot less, and they pay less for water, they pay less for everything. Uh, than someone that's living in the city. So it's a disadvantage already in the city. And so what are we gonna do to help us look holistically, collectively at the issue in terms of progress? Thank you, Carl. That's a huge question. And um, I think you pinpointed three areas. The data itself um, and the perceptions that come with that. Um, looking at a different lens in terms of assets and faith. And actually, there's so much to learn from the global environment there because youth are looked at as assets in many of the programs and faith is brought in. Um, but how, how can we collectively make this change? And I, um, I would open it up to our panelists. Um, at the same time, part of this initiative with Bloomberg and, and many of us at the table through other national networks are thinking about how do we work collectively, because not one of us can really make any serious uh, impact on our own. So this idea of collective impact, probably Monique may talk about that a little bit later from the Aspen Institute, but your question is spot on and, and it's up to us collectively to address that um, since we don't have the answers on our own. Um, any comments from the panel? The, um, um among the assets or good positive things that could be in a young person's life, a sense of religiosity and connections, the connections they have, the social capital they have through, uh, uh, through religious institutions is very strongly correlated with success. Again, it alone can't do it, but it is one of the positive things that makes a difference. And then it, in addition to that for the young person, it's also in many areas a fantastic social delivery um, system that is better than the one that the government has. We obviously in this country have a lot of ideological questions of some people don't want faith institutions involved at all in, in some people 
only want to do th things. So it's an unfortunate, I think, hot button. If you're a young family and you need diapers, do you really care what the sign on the door said if you get to go in and, and have um, uh, get diapers? Um, and in the conferences, events that I go to, I rarely see um, faith-based organizations in the room, and I think that's a detriment to us all. I think we need to make those bridges a lot better, more intentionally than we have. Um, a, one thing with the tax bill that's going through right now, the House made a, uh, a clause in it that would said that you could begin to um, support and endorse political candidates from the pulpit. The Senate did not, and we'll see in the conference report which side wins in that discussion. I think the, another point that, that was made sort of collectively, what, whether it's the data that's fragmented or the programs that's fragmented, we've created all these fragmentations. Uh, in Maryland, uh, we're fortunate in that our state constitution says that one of the two responsibilities of state government is providing an appropriate education. I would think that youth who are not graduating to jobs and uh, you know, it's not by definition not an appropriate education. So there may be ways, again, politically, uh, to try to figure out how do you not change one funding stream or six different funding streams coming out of different, whether it's state appropriations committees or federal appropriations committees, or getting 17 foundations to work with each other, but stepping back and looking at the data about the overall outcomes, and then trying to develop policies and procedures and supports uh, that, that essentially are looking at the bottom line, not the, the various specific aspects of that, and, and using the data to be able to demonstrate that, the, that, that one, some of the policies and procedures you know, that are in the, the bill that may come into being are actually gonna move things in the wrong direction. Uh, on the other hand, where there are examples, and, and there are examples in many of our communities of things that are very positive, that they've been able to make advances on at least a subset of, the, of, of these things, or where there have been collaborations between the, the nonprofits and the employers and the academic institutions, uh, where they're really making, you know, to be able to then say, how can we move this to more, to more jurisdictions, making this more of a national issue, as opposed to be thinking that somehow each, whether it's a Baltimore City or Chicago or anything is gonna be able to do enough by itself, given it's still living in, in a, a, a really disembodied uh, and really sort of chaotic sort of situation in terms of programming and other things. So again, I think it's about, you know, what, what are sort of the underpinning things and, and are there leverages that can move several things at the same time? Terrific. Um, oh, I just wanted to add one oh, thing. Oh, excellent. Thank yeah. you, Rebecca. Um, just to say that the data is very limited, um, and we're working with the U.S. Census data, so that in itself has so many flaws of categorizing people in a really old-fashioned system that just has persisted for decades, um, and to also say that, that that budget also may be on the chopping block, so we hope there's better ways to look at these these youth going forward, but that the census is sort of what we're working with, and it's a, it's a very limited tool that we have. Great. Somebody pointed to a hand. Oh, Sean? Okay, excellent. So we'll get those on tape. But there are other hands, I'll just write down the next one so that we don't lose those. Okay, young lady in the back. Okay, yeah, Sean. Um, yeah, my question is specifically for um, Professor Leaf. <clears throat> so when you put up the slide as far as like um, where like most of the, like for instance, when they said that homicide was like the, the number one killer of black communities, and I noticed that the second category was unintentional in injury. I wanted you to unpack that a little bit, um, and I'm wondering if substance abuse is in that, because when we're talking about public health for opportunity youth, like substance abuse is like really big and I didn't really see that come up. Um, and I believe, you know, it's the reason why parents aren't in the home. It's the reason why um, young people who are not getting the services they need are self-medicating themselves while they're overdosing. And, you know, it's pouring into the white community so it's time to get attention. But it's been in our communities forever. So I just want to know, one, what was in that unintentional injury section? Um, and then if you have any insight on where substance abuse falls into this big picture of public health. Okay, well the unintentional injuries usually access some things. Is Josh still here? Some, there's somebody actually in the room who may know whether overdoses are included in unintentional injuries or not, given 
the audience, no? Yes. yes? Okay, so they are there, and, and it's likely given the increase mm -hmm. in overdoses over the last two or three years, uh, where it's always been in, in the, the black communities, and it's now nationally increasing, but also increasing in the black communities because of the nature of the drugs that are coming in. But I think, so, so essentially those are, again, both the homicides, uh, which, which uh, and, and, and then the unintentional injuries, which, which for those, you know, obviously for the one to four year olds, it's not overdoses, uh, but certainly for, for the adolescent, you know, the older adolescents and the young adults, increasingly those, those are overdoses. Uh, and I think the question, it's back to what are some of the structural things that are, that are creating these and how do you uh, both get people into recovery and stay in recovery? Uh, but also, how do, you, how do you get people to not feel so disengaged that they're feeling that this is something they have to do? A lot of the drug use, and people in the room can talk about it better than I, is really self-medication. I mean, people are using these things because their lives, it gets them away from their lives. Uh, and it's back to how do we create a positive environment so that people don't feel they want to do that. Uh, you know, the disengaged youth is not just not having a job or not going to school. There's a lot of pieces of that. Uh, that, that essentially both disengaging from your community, not feeling that anybody cares about you, or only a very limited number of people that care about you and none of them have any power, so they can't really help you. And I think part of what, again, back to the sort of the root causes or, or some of the components, how do we create those things? And whether it's faith communities or neighborhoods or other things, one of the things that's happened, just for people having to tr go further, longer to work, there's just fewer people in the neighborhoods. They don't have the time, you know, now they're tired. I mean, literally, if you're working now, paid eight hours, but you're, you know, you're sort of working 12 hours between when you leave and come back, you don't have the time to do the voluntary thing, kind of things. You can't go to your, you don't want, you have to cook for your children, you have to go clean your clothes. There's just a lot of things you need to do that in the, in the 50s, where you had stay-at-home mothers and a lot of other things, uh, but we're seeing a lot of these in, institutions, whether it's the political networks, uh, or the social networks and even the church networks are much more fragmented. People drop, come in on Sunday uh, and they're not in, in that neighborhood the rest, of the, or the rest of the time as much as they had been in the past. So again, again, so I think part of what's really very, again, looking at some of the solutions is when, you look, when we look at some of the subgroups, uh, some, some of the homeless groups, particularly the, the homeless adolescents and the kind of networks that they are creating to support each other. Uh, some of the kind of things that are going on that you'll hear from some of the self-reports and, and that Chris Wilson will talk about tonight of individuals who really are very capable and then looking about how they can be working with employing people who look like them. They were five years ago, six years ago uh, to, to you know, again sort of reaching back and try to do some employment. Um, one of the things that Hopkins has done is trying to look at people in, this, in these neighborhoods and giving a priority both to purchasing things from the local city but also trying to get employment uh, for people working in these institutions, because not all the jobs, and not, in fact, not most of the jobs at a Johns Hopkins hospital are, are doctors or nurses. There's a huge number of very different kind of people that work in all of our institutions, uh, and, and at least our institution has had made a commitment to try to make sure, to try to attempt to hire people, which also means making sure that they're getting the support, not hiring them and seeing them fail, but putting in the support system mm -hmm. so that they will be successful. Um, and, and again, incorporating the other employees to make sure they're also working. Again, it's not somebody just in the HR department. It's taking, trying to get every, all of us being taking on some of the responsibilities. Um, what is it we can be doing to part of the solution as opposed to thinking it's only government or only some NGO? Uh, I think increasingly, as the young people are doing, they're all taking on the initiative. They're taking on the saying, this is part, they gotta be part of the solution and they wanna be part of the solution. I think some of our uh, some of us others also need to listen to see how we can be part of the solution, not telling people, but listening and then being part of the solutions. Thank you, Phil. Um, I just put up this slide a little bit to show, in practice and programs, there's a full continuum as youth come in and out of um, different initiatives, depending upon where they are in their life cycle or or interests, and. Um, it's in, you know it's contingent upon us really as organizations, systems, and policies, really to make sure those are aligned. But we can't do it without a greater health perspective around healthy relationships, strong youth adult partnerships, and then helping youth build social networks. Um, some of the best solutions in the field have come already from many of the young leaders as they come together um, and put. Uh, larger frameworks and, and policy plans together. 
Um, I saw a few more questions. I think we're getting close to time. This young lady in the back. Okay, so we'll do at least two, and, and you're next. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to follow on your point about youth being the solution, or part of the solution. Um, a couple of years ago, we did focus groups in 10 different communities across the country in pretty much every de demographic group you can think of, but these are all young people between 12 and 17 who get free and reduced price lunch or some sort of SNAP or some sort of food assistance. It was a study on teen hunger, right? Um, and the, the commonalities were really compelling about the incredible role that young people are taking on in their families in the context of the social safety net is not there. Their parents, even if they're working all day, can't make enough money to keep it afloat. And young people are like, hey, I'm stepping up. I'm helping my brothers and sisters out. I'm helping to support myself. I'm helping my parents, right? They're taking on really adult roles. So they look for work if they can find a traditional job. If they can't do that, they're doing hair. They're selling candy. They're trying to raise money in that way. If they can't do that, then boys you know, do what boys do and girls do what girls do, right? Because everybody needs to try to find a way to contribute to their family when there's not enough, right? But one of the complexities is that people who work with um, opportunity youth after you've dropped out, you start asking adult questions, you start asking those questions that you were talking about, LaShawn, about, you know, how are you? Why aren't you showing up? What's wrong? How can we support you, right? But our school systems don't ask adult questions of young people. And young people are playing really important, vital adult roles in their families. So I think there's a question about upstream, how can we equip our K through 12 system to be attuned to the realities and the, the great responsibilities the young people have and the skills that they have to be able to manage those tremendous responsibilities? How do we make school schedules flexible for them? How do we make resources available for them? We just had a, a, a short convening about this in DC with just some, a few players around the table. It was really interesting because there was a DCPS school that did a, a design project about how could you help um, kids succeed and go to school regularly. And the kinds of solutions they come up with is, are, we need different school schedules. We need connections to work before we have to drop out, right? Before. So, yeah, you know, I, I, there's such a need to address the need for folks who've already dropped out. That's super, super important. But in, particularly with all the resources being stretched, I think it would be really great to start thinking a little bit about how we can roll that into our conventional systems to support kids and, and, and where they are and, and, uh, and, and, and cherish them within our traditional uh, systems instead of like, well, you failed, so now we'll fix you, right? Um, so I just wanted to, to share that. Um, the other one, just very short thing, we did some studies on kids who um, have dropped out who are working, right? Because they're kind of not in this equation at all. But they're not qualitatively different than the other kids. If they've dropped out, they're no more likely to go back to school. They're more, no more likely to work uh, more hours or earn more money, right? And they're just as poor. Uh, so a lot, of, and, and we know that uh, employment is fluid right, for, for young people particularly. So I, I would also encourage us to think a little bit more broadly about what it means um, to be one of these kids um, and, and think about their assets and how we can support them better in our traditional systems. Thank you very much. We are actually out of time, so I'm going to honor the, uh, the young woman in the back who has been raising her hand for some time to share your thoughts or, or comments. Maisha, members of US Department of Labor, Division of Youth Services. Um, we have announced a um, youth cohort challenge where we're asking communities to apply. There's no money attached to it, so there, there's no money. No money. <laughs> Uh-oh. But, <laughs> but we're asking communities to do in the workforce system to do is to get together at the table and to help us better understand how to serve our out-of-school youth and to look into youth voice and to look into community partnerships and to better do a job so we can better put out funding announcements that look at the system, because we can't, we know our program, especially the workforce system program, or the faith space, like that is said, we can't do it on our own, but how do we build systems within our communities, and every community is different, we're looking for rural, suburban, rural, you know, um, urban, we'll probably get a lot more urban applicants, but we're looking for different, um, 
models to help us better understand how to put out better funding announcements, how to help our workforce system serve our young people. And what I'm learning um, more and more is that, um, and I was in Baltimore at Annie Casey a couple months ago, you know, youth voice, if we don't have youth voice, and I'm actually doing a webinar in January on youth voice along with HHS, and I'm doing another webinar later on in the year. But if we don't have young people actively engaged in this profile work, we are in trouble because we think as adults we know the answer and I'm learning <laughs> very hard that these young people, depending on where they live, um, you know, we have youth bill, we have a lot of youth voice at the national level, but we have to really ask these young people, what can we do to help you? Instead of telling them, we're going to help you. And we're hoping that this announcement, and we're hoping the communities that apply, we're hoping to learn better on how to ask the right questions of our young people. And I'm excited about this announcement. I'm hoping that we can come back and another symposium and share what we're learning. It's only a 12-week, um, basically, symposium of learning for communities. And I'm hoping that we can take what we've learned today, I can take it back, and we can um, learn about how to best serve our young people. So I'm excited about that. Well, not, that's, that couldn't be a better way to end on Youth Voice. So I want to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists today. And I will turn it to Tamar to talk about next steps. Thank you. And thank you to you also, uh, Patrice, for moderating. So, wow, we have heard a lot of input and information this morning. Um, it's clear that our country is failing many of our young people. And this problem is really deep-seated. It's really large in scope. And you know, when we think about youth who are defined using a more traditional definition of disconnection, we're talking about almost five million young people. And as we heard earlier, when we expand that definition further, we're talking about 14 million. So really, we, we, we are failing many of our young people. We need to think about how can we come together and um, work on solutions. Um, what we're going to do now is to break up into different sessions. We'll have 10 different breakout sessions, uh, tables, and we will dig into some of these issues. So the breakout sessions this morning are going to be focused a lot on issues around data. What are the data gaps? What are ways we can think about to push our use of data in new directions? And you know, let's kind of keep this lens in mind as we hear all of the speakers in terms of thinking about what are the gaps that we're hearing? Where can we make a difference? So for instance, we have really compelling data about race and place and disparities. What about the whys? Why are we seeing these types of disparities in these places, in this way? And as Lashana Amato reminded us, we need the voices of young people themselves. How can we use data to really capture young people's perspectives? We also heard about the importance of data on the impact of programs and of assets on youth outcomes. How can we expand that kind of data and how can we leverage those data really productively? We also heard from Thaddeus Ferber about the, the, the fragmentation of systems, the disconnection of data. How can we better integrate the data that is out there and think about really being able to heal some of this fragmentation and better coordinate? So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, in terms of logistics, you have two numbers on the back of your badge. I think someone is gonna help, Akola is gonna help with the logistics piece. So before I turn it over to Akola, let me just say that all of you here in this room were sort of handpicked and invited. This was not an open um, meeting and you're here because we know that you have a great deal to contribute to this conversation. So I really wanna encourage all of you to share your voice, share your perspective, come to the table and, um, and, and really put your heads together. We really care about what you have to say. And now I'll turn it over to Akola Francis for some more details on where you should go next and what's gonna happen. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing well. So 
the, you're looking at the yellow sticker on the back of your badge for your morning session breakout. If your sticker says Finestone, you stay in this room. If it says W1030, you can just go to the back of the room and someone will escort you there. Um, if you're W2017, look for Asari. Asari, can you wave your hand? You can meet with her and she'll escort you to your room. If you are W3011, you can see Dory. She's waving in the back. And if you are W4013, you can meet me in the front. If you do not have a breakout assignment, please see Kristen and Tamar, and they'll be able to assist you with your assignment. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna begin our Q&A uh, summary of the breakout sessions, and for that, I would like to introduce Nick Greer. Nick is the Vice President of Interconnection of Thread, which is a phenomenal program that's based here in Baltimore. I can have you, um, he, hopefully Nick will have a little bit of time to briefly tell you about what Thread is, but it's a phenomenal program for um, Opportunity Youth. He has over 14 years of experience in urban education, where he has worked at several levels in the school system such as being the director of science of the Baltimore City Public Schools, and then seven years as a high school biology teacher in Baltimore City Schools, which in 2009 earned him the high honor of being Baltimore City Teacher of the Year. So with that, I welcome Nick Greer um, to lead us off on our summary of the breakouts. Just, yes? Yeah, hi. Hey, everyone. Um, I have the amazingly enviable uh, role today of uh, pulling together everything that you all just said and uh, pulling it into some themes. Um, this, I think, is, is difficult in one way because I'm standing here in front of all of you and I'm not an opportunity youth, right? Um, and so I wanna honor that from the step, from the get, and from the jump, right? Uh, I work in a program that does work with opportunity youth, but I am not myself, so I just wanna own that and honor it. And we have a lots of voices in this room. I get to hear from several of you, which I think is phenomenal. I think that what some of the themes that I'm hearing as we go through this, um, and sort of just to honor what, what uh, Kristen just said, we can talk about thread at another time. Um, let's do that like over lunch or something. Um, but in, in this program, I think, or in this, in this session, some of the themes that we're hearing is youth. Youth voice, youth more, youth more, right? I heard across the divisions and some of these questions, right, uh, just in the couple of seconds that we got to talk about them, like youth, if you were gonna survey youth, let's have youth build these surveys, right? Then let's have them disseminate the learning <laughs> Let's have them conduct the surveys, right? Um, so if we wanna get answers to some of these questions, then we should be asking different people to conduct and build the surveys for us than we already are. Um, first big theme. I heard that across at least two to three of the rooms. Um, the, the next thing I think we heard is this idea that um, if young people don't feel connected to the work that they're doing, or even if they are not fitting into that traditional definition of 16 to 24, I'm out of a job and I'm not in school, I might be in a job in which I don't feel connected to. And that's an expansion of the definition I think we heard not only at my table, but then we heard a follow-up from one of the other rooms that if, if the system isn't just connecting with the student in a way that's allowing them to feel and see and understand the options beyond the work that they're trying to do, then we're not gonna solve much, right? Um, and we're also not going to end up creating long-lasting relationships that end up owning the fact that just by having somebody, I'm gonna just speak to something that came up at one of our tables, or at my table, right? Just by having somebody work with you for five weeks for an internship is not helping. Right? It's an opportunity for a job, but it's not an opportunity for a long-standing relationship to make sure that that individual, that person is okay in the long run and has options beyond that. Right? Um, and please feel free to interact a little bit and tell me, like, does this resonate with things that you're hearing in some of your other tables? Maybe, I see some head nods, maybe some snaps. 
that'd be cool. Like, um, so the, um, I think one of the other pieces that we're hearing is, um, When it comes down to uh, kind of understanding, I think one of the rooms is talking about the improvement of the measurements um, and how we can actually improve those measurements. Um, there needs to be more, like, we, we heard this this morning a lot, like there's a lot of fragmentation in the data. There's a lot of data that's out in the space and is just out there. Is it actionable? How do we actually make it actionable? And so some of those gaps that were highlighted in that space are this, this idea that if we collect data to the nines and we can talk about it, and I think what, what Phil was saying a little bit earlier uh, totally resonates, we can just keep collecting, keep collecting, but if we can't actually uh, connect those pieces together, then it's not actually gonna, there's not gonna be any synergy, there's not gonna be any opportunities for uh, any, any individual to make those connection points make sense or to make that active in their lives. Um, for them to feel that that point of growth. Um, another piece that we heard from from that same group was that, you know, standards right now are actually holding us back. Um, if you think about the way that standards work, right? In one point, standards are there to make sure that there's program quality. But we're hearing earlier this morning that like there's no silver bullet, there's no one program, there's no one approach. It's actually a complex. Um, um, ecosystem, right? And it takes more than one program, it takes more than one approach. So if, if standards are actually saying to programs, like, this is the way we do things, do it this way, collect this data, because that's the data that's easy to collect, right? Um, or because that's the data that we listen to, but that's not responsive to a youth's needs, that's not responsive to someone who's in this situation's needs in any way, shape, or form, then we're not gonna be able to do anything. So if those standards are holding us back, we need to disregard or change, and we need to involve youth, again, same theme, involve youth in trying to understand and change those pieces of, of uh, standard, like standard practices, standard operating procedures, standard pieces of data that we collect. Um, resonate, not resonate? I think we heard this in a couple of different places, right? Um, again, um, you know, uh, another way that we heard it was in one of the other rooms um, in terms of using data to understand trauma, um, that, you know, when it comes down to program fidelity and measuring that program fidelity, that, that the model itself, and this is something that I'll say, I'm just gonna flat out own, like at Thread, we like, don't quite do well yet, right? We look at a model that we think works because it has data that shows that it works. However, very often we're, and we're just in the middle of a conversation about this the other day, right? About when we break the model, we're actually not doing service to those who are in the program, right? As far as the volunteers or as far as the, um, the, the students that we work with. When it comes down to it, program fidelity in terms of if we live and die by the model that we know, that has not been working, then we actually have to question that model. Same point of questioning the standards, question the model, begin to like reframe and not just live and die by that particular model or that particular approach that hasn't always worked. I think we heard this a little bit earlier in what you were saying, right? Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, talking to youth early and often about how can we restructure the system so that it's actually inviting to me. That might not be, nine to five, eight to three, or whatever in terms of school, it could be then some of the non-traditional models that we actually see being more impactful. Um, you know, uh, when we heard from some of the groups that were, one of the groups that was talking about in what ways can we um, fill gaps in the actual data itself, um, you know, there's, there's a big thing that we heard this morning in terms of that data being um, misunderstood and actually it, inform, it informs systems. So if it's not actually connected to all the other systems that are in play, then we have, we have a challenge in terms of being able to um, um, put that into action or make connections across that. So all of that little bit of rambling, right, that I'm kind of like going through as I like share some of the highlights that we heard from some of the tables that we were at, what I really want to put into, to, into motion are three points, right? So first, youth, voice. Bring youth voice into whatever programs we're working in and ask what's needed, right? Ask them to help develop the measures, ask them to help develop the, the systems, um, and even some of the structures, right? Um, it doesn't mean, 
uh, that we have to completely throw out all approaches that we know are working, right? Um, but second thing, this is complex, so we need to align and understand more about who is doing what. And so that means the data cannot be fragmented. So second point, fragmented data does nothing, right? And I'll go even one step further. Data does nothing if we can't actually put it into motion. And what I think is really, really critical here and what we're hearing across tables, across the conversation this morning, there's a recognition of that, right? There's definitely a recognition of that, but I would also say that we need, tie it to number one, more youth to take a look at those data and how they are playing out on the ground, right? And then the final point that I haven't really like dialogued about yet, but I've saved it because at this point, it's a good moment to kind of talk about what we do. And again, we are a part of a complex set of programs that we do one piece, right? And we like to say that we kind of work with whole child. We don't do it as well as everybody. And we definitely don't do it as well as every other program that's in a student's life, right? That is gonna move forward. So this last piece is really that enduring relationships are what's gonna pull us out of everything, right? No matter whether you're sitting in this room right now and you're opportunity youth or not, a relationship is what you need in order to thrive and overcome barriers, right? And so when it comes down to the, the work that Thread does, um, all we do is we place people together to make connections that are lasting, trusting, and caring. And we believe fundamentally that if you have a person in your life, and this is a theme that we heard across the rooms, if there is someone in that person's life who can truly look at you, see you, and care for you, then that person will not let you fall. When it comes down to this challenge that we're in in this world, right? Um, or in this city, or in our communities, or even in our homes. If we're isolated, there's no chance to move forward. And so, and, and isolated can mean surrounded by lots of people that are in the same situations as yourself. What we do in the program that I work at, and I would say what lots of other programs do as well, I, I know for sure Opportunity Youth United is doing this through the mentoring programs that they're doing. I know for sure that there's tons of programs in this room and in the city that do this just as well, if not better than we do, and that all of that amassed together, as we heard this morning, is the complex like nature of this work and is what makes a difference for any one individual. When it comes down to it, it's relationships. No amount of data can ever tell us to care for someone. We have to take those moments. What the data can do for us is elucidate where people are not cared for. And I think there's a slight distinction in this, right? So if we're using the data in its power, and if we do end up pulling it together and it's not fragmented and we can take a look at the whole city and understand exactly what's going on, it means nothing if we can't actually step in, knock on doors and say, are you okay, to our neighbors, and actually mean it, right? Um, and so I think, you know, there was a, um, I think I, sorry, I have it in a separate, kept it here. I just don't want to get it wrong. Um, something that was said earlier. Um, you know, what LaShawn said earlier, and I'm going to paraphrase, and I'm also going to get it wrong in terms of I know I'm missing one of the bullets, but uh, I was like frantically, like, oh, where's my pen? <laughs> I got to go. Um, so like young people need more than jobs and research outcomes. What they need are healing, and they need healthy outcomes, um, and they need, I'm going to paraphrase completely here, but pulling that all together, the relationships in people's lives, right? Um, and I think I'm getting that definitely wrong, but I think it resonated with me in terms of, like, it takes whole person care. Those words are very critical, and when the, when the data is fragmented or when the data is not actually being actionable in a way that can pull people and drive them towards action to strong, trusting, thriving relationships that you would have with your own family members, right, um, that those types of relationships that will not let you fall, um, that's when the data can actually become actionable. Um, and so, you know, um, I really, really feel 
just in this room, there's a huge sense of understanding. There's a huge sense of like, let's move forward, let's get to action. But I also feel and understand that like, we've got a lot of data. Who was surprised this morning at any of that stuff? There's a difference between surprised and like, it resonated with you, but who was surprised? We're not surprised by this stuff, right? Just gonna step out there and say, let's move it to action in terms of in whatever program you're in, connect with those other programs, connect with those other people, and connect with your neighbors. Ask them how they are and mean it. 